Welcome to Good God, Conversations That Matter About Faith and Public Life. I am your host, George Mason, and I'm so glad to welcome to the program in this series on poverty and its alleviation in our communities, the president and CEO of the Parkland Foundation in Dallas, Texas, Michael Horn. Michael, we're so glad to have you with us. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm glad to be here. Great. So tell everybody a little bit about the Parkland Foundation. Now, uh, you uh, came to this job from being in Dallas. You were working with charter schools, the KIPP schools, and uh, mostly in uh, South Dallas and more disadvantaged neighborhoods and that sort of thing. So you had work with people who have experienced poverty before. This kind of work is a bit of an extension of that, isn't it? It really is. Um, you know, my, my life's work has been oriented towards the social enterprise space, uh, creating conditions in which individuals and communities can realize their full promise and potential. Uh, did that on the education side, but I would say um, healthcare similarly um, is uh, an avenue and certainly a, a context in which it's really important um, that uh, communities have access to the type of care they need uh, to, to realize their full promise and potential. And so uh, the foundation uh, at Parkland uh, exists um, to raise awareness and philanthropic support uh, to really accelerate the work of the hospital. Um, and most recently, our focus has really been increasing access to care um, as a critical way to address longstanding and persistent health disparities that we know um, have been in place for, for decades uh, throughout Dallas County. Well, let's talk about those, those disparities, but before we get to that, I, I think it would be helpful probably for people, everyone doesn't understand the distinctions among types of hospitals providing healthcare in, in a community. Can you sort of enumerate those for us and where Parkland fits in that ecology? Yeah, certainly. So uh, Parkland Hospital is a, a public hospital system. And so uh, specifically what that means is that I would say a substantial portion of funding uh, that Parkland receives is derived from, uh, from government funding. Uh, specifically, if we just look at um, the, the last fiscal year, so FY19, um, about you know, 48% of uh, our revenue came from what we say patient services, 29% uh, were derived from property taxes um, as a, a public entity, and about 13% from, from government programs. And so the, the sources of revenue really center around uh, funding that we receive as a public entity to ultimately support uh, the service delivery model that we have. Um, there are other certainly systems, uh, private systems um, that uh, often rely uh, more heavily on a, a different type of payer mix in terms of the, the revenue that they receive, as well as faith-based um, hospital systems. Um, that uh, certainly have a, a mission and I would say a programmatic orientation uh, really uh, guided by a, a spiritual or, or religious um, kind of ethos. And so um, while that is not necessarily the, the focus of Parkland, I would be remiss in not saying that you know, our mission uh, being uh, dedicated to the health and well-being of individuals uh, and communities entrusted to our care um, and even how we, we live that out um, is very much focused on the idea of, of empathy, of, of compassion, of, of service. I think principles that we would say are, are, are certainly spiritually related or humanistic. And so um, I, I do want to make the, the, the clear distinction, but also recognize that even a system uh, such as Parkland, you know, the idea of, of spiritual care um, is definitely rooted in how we see the types of service that we provide to those in the community, particularly those who are most vulnerable. Well, those who are most vulnerable is part of where I think that connection is made because people of faith tend to start with this idea that true faith is, um, is validated, you might say, by whether we are taking care of, as the scripture says, the least of these, our brothers and sisters, right? That is those who are hungry and thirsty, those who are sick, those who are in prison, those who are in need. And so as a society, if we only commodified health care, right, if we only made it something that people could get if they could afford to pay for it, uh, then 
we would be failing in that regard because uh, there's so many people who would not be able to afford their care. And so a public hospital has a kind of mandate to serve everyone, doesn't it? It really does. Um, and, you know, that is a, a key distinction for, for Parkland as a, a public hospital system. And I think what it does is it also elevates um, the, the tension, frankly, that exists um, mm-hmm. in, at a macro level in the, the, the broader kind of uh, public health and, and health uh, space. And that is, you know, we, we recognize that costs increase. Uh, we recognize that, you know, our, our reimbursement um, uh, kind of uh, system is, is oriented um, in some ways to, to preference a, a type of patient. What we are aiming to do at Parkland is to really create a, um, an environment, an ecosystem in which irrespective of your zip code, irrespective of your socioeconomic status, we truly believe that you should still have access to high quality and compassionate care. And I would kind of uh, submit that we take that a little further and that is to say, if we actually create a space uh, in which um, individuals, irrespective of zip code and background have access to high quality care, we actually, from an economic standpoint, uh, can really kind of shift um, the kind of two-tier system that we often find ourselves in, in which the kind of haves uh, continue to, to uh, progress and the have-nots uh, do, do not. Um, you know, if we get to this beloved community um, that I know Dr. King and others spoke of, you know, I, I think public institutions like a Parkland really are the epicenter of, of how we are reframing and reimagining um, the, the type of, of public institutions that need to be at the core of, of how we operate as a society rooted in those, those principles of service, those principles of inclusivity, uh, and certainly equity. So we, we have a society uh, that, on the one hand, uh, really favors a kind of free enterprise economic marketplace, you might say, and uh, that has uh, insurance companies and uh, insurance that comes through your, often uh, through your employer. And then of course we have the Affordable Care Act where you can buy into uh, this insurance and and often have it subsidized. Uh, But uh, there are many people without any insurance. And uh, Parkland is a place where people go and actually Parkland even goes beyond its own place. It goes into communities, right, uh, to deliver healthcare and clinics and community-based kind of clinics too. So when you say that Parkland really specializes, in a sense, in making sure that no one is left out of care, uh, that's, that's actually something that, no, not to denigrate other hospitals, because they have certain mandates as well uh, it, for the public health, but Parkland is the sort of go-to place, you might say, isn't it? I would agree. And I think to your last point, the, 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 the complexity of the challenges and opportunities that we see in the healthcare space um, and just the social space in general is such that, you know, we need the constellation of actors and stakeholders really, you know, driving uh, uh, the work forward. And so Parkland really has, has existed since 1894 um, in, a, in a kind of, uh, kind of a under, under the understanding that you know, we really need to, to bring the care uh, to the patient. Um, we are, are certainly uh, grateful for the tremendous outpouring of support uh, from Dallas County taxpayers and certainly the, the broader philanthropic community locally and abroad that, um, that invested in what we call a new Parkland, our new Parkland campus, um, and, and certainly having a, that, that new space, what it allows us to, to do uh, on a day-to-day basis. And even now, um, as we are still confronting uh, this global pandemic, with that being said, we also know that for many of our patients, um, we find that they are caught in this, this really dangerous uh, calculus. And that is, you know, making a decision to either accept or forego care because of the, the real life barriers to even getting uh, to their appointment. Um, and that is, you know, do I take off of work or do I take several DART buses um, to get to right. the hospital? Right. Um, and in doing so, you know, don't receive, I get docked for my pay and I can't pay for food or child care. And so our response increasingly has been, we really need to go to, to the community. Um, and, you know, when I think about, you know, again, this idea as a metaphor of, of ministry, uh, certainly it is 
to step outside the walls. Uh, we have to do that uh, increasingly, uh, recognizing that you know everyone is positioned differently um, where they are, and the barriers may be different. However, our response has to be such that you know we can continue to dismantle um, those those barriers um, that may really be. Uh, in, th in many cases, um, you know, life and death um, as it pertains to the ability for our patients to, to gain access to the type of care that they increasingly need. You mentioned the new Parkland facility, and if people in Dallas County have not visited the new Parkland, uh, they would be amazed at that extraordinary building. I mean, I've been here long enough to have remembered the old Parkland, of course, and there was an older Parkland before that, uh, yes. as, as a matter of fact. It's been turned into a beautiful office complex now. But this new Parkland is state of the art and is, it was, what, what was it, $1.2 billion or something like that? Yes, yeah, it was. And, and you know, uh, the, the foundation played a critical role, raising $150 million uh, to, to really support uh, the development of, of, that, uh, of, our, of our new campus. And when I walk the halls, one of the, the things that really is striking beyond the, the aesthetics, and certainly from, a, from an architectural engineering standpoint, um, you know, the intentionality in design is really the ways in which Parkland um, has, you know, brought to life a core value of dignity. Um, and that is, I think for, for many individuals, um, particularly in the healthcare space, mm -hmm. and especially I would say in engaging with vulnerable communities, there's this misconception that the ability for someone to pay or not pay then dictates the, the type of care that they should receive right. and even the environment in which they should receive right. that care. And right. we've kind of flipped that to say, no, actually, we believe that everyone should have access to, to state-of-the-art uh, technologies, uh, comfortable uh, uh, spaces, uh, you know, the, the opportunity for natural light to come in because we actually know the impact um, is well-documented that, that physical uh, environments have on uh, health and well-being. And so the, the ability to kind of all, to bring together and bring to bear all of those elements um, in a facility um, is, is remarkable and is something that I, I don't lose sight of uh, when I'm uh, in the hospital. Great. Well, it, it is a beautiful thing. And I, I think anyone who goes there for care would sense the extraordinary care that went into making it up uh, in, 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 in making sure that everybody, everybody has an opportunity not only to basic care, but to all the other things that go into bringing about uh, health and including the fact that Parkland is involved in initiatives, as you say, to prevent illness too. Uh, this is a big part of what's going on right now in healthcare that drives people into poverty is that if people who are poor get sick, then there is a spiral down that happens for them in their families. Can you say a few words about, about that phenomenon? Yeah, so, you know, what we have found uh, most recently um, in an in a assessment of, of healthcare challenges um, uh, called the Community Health Needs Assessment. This was a uh, report or study that was done between Parkland Hospital and the Dallas County Health and Human Services Department is really to, to bring to light uh, some of the, the challenges that exist. Um, and I would say at its core is this idea that for far too many uh, residents of Dallas County, um, the inability to receive the care, and I would say care that's more focused on upstream uh, healthcare opportunities, um, the preventative measures, uh, certainly uh, uh, managing, uh, managing uh, healthcare, um, really in, in promoting um, certainly the prevention of diseases, um, if, if, if for many individuals, they are, are certainly not unfortunately positioned in the system such that that is the, the main orientation that they, they have, what then happens is certainly um, the, the individual uh, suffers and then those who are connected to the individual, whether it be uh, families and whole communities, uh, certainly, uh, certainly suffer. And so 
what we've tried to do and what we've done is one, first kind of bring a, a greater level of transparency to, to those challenges um, that exist. And, you know, there are a couple. One, you know, we know that, you know, if we look at Dallas County, about 78% of Dallas County residents are, are insured. Um, that 78% is compared to about 82% of Texans and 90% of individuals across the United States. Within those, uh, those, uh, those uh, slices, if you will, um, 64% of Latinx individuals across Dallas County um, have access to insurance. And that is the lowest rate for racial and ethnic groups across uh, Dallas County. And so certainly just even accessing care uh, is, a, is a challenge that we continue to confront. What that then means is those are the populations that increasingly are most vulnerable, confronting a series of mortality and morbidity factors, whether it be heart disease, uh, hypertension, uh, late stage breast cancer diagnoses, uh, pediatric uh, asthma, uh, particularly I would say for Latinx and African-American communities across Dallas County. And then if we zoom in, there are a series of, of neighborhoods and communities on the kind of Southern belt um, that are disproportionately uh, uh, being impacted as it relates to, to, those, uh, to those diseases that I mentioned. And so, um, so the first step was we, we have to really bring, some, bring to light what is actually happening. Right. The second thing that we then did is we said, well, you know, identifying the challenge is, is certainly only part of the solution. We got to then have a plan <laughs> to respond. And so, you know, our community health needs assessment implementation plan is really oriented towards advancing a series of initiatives rooted in this belief that if we address healthcare disparities, um, but do so in a way that improves access to care, that highlights and promotes uh, 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 disease prevention and certainly uh, puts in, in motion more preventative measures, um, that we then will lead to a place where the overall health quotient of Dallas County will increase more and more uh, individuals will actually be in a position from an economic standpoint um, to, to contribute in the ways that they want to contribute, but have been prevented uh, based on uh, their, their health conditions for far too long. And so, you know, we're, we're doing things like increasing health centers, uh, bringing a center to Redbird, um, expanding our operation in Vickery, um, thinking more about virtual care. Since the pandemic, we've seen an, an exponential growth in uh, patients who are accessing uh, care virtually, whether it be through the telephone or through platforms like we're doing now uh, virtually with, with Zoom. Um, um, that certainly allows for greater connectivity um, as well as um, reduces some of the challenges that we see where individuals may not be able to actually physically get to uh, their appointments. Now, with that also comes the recognition that for many patients and individuals across Dallas County, there's a broadband and internet gap. And so uh -huh. we have to also work on the built environment. We necessarily can't do that alone, but we can work in partnership with other um, organizations uh, to transform the environment in which things such as virtual care uh, can, be, uh, can be offered. And so, so that's the kind of second piece. The third thing I will say is, there's an intersectionality, like in most things, between kind of health outcomes and other social determinants of health, right? Which is to say, if we can, um, if we can ensure that more and more individuals, uh, particularly those who are disproportionately at risk for, for uh, diseases such as you know, diabetes or hypertension, have access to healthier foods, uh, have, have you know, better uh, transportation um, uh, opportunities. Certainly are positioned from a workforce uh, uh, standpoint uh, to, to, uh, to, to gain a job with livable wage. Right? If we can start to connect those dots, then individuals are more, uh, more likely to certainly be in a position uh, ultimately to be healthier, um, especially if they are, are caregivers to then provide for their environment. And so we start to see this kind of knockoff effect over time where, you know, children are kind of going through the, the continuum uh, in a space where, you know, they can grow up and mature um, in a much healthier uh, uh, fashion and manner. And so, you know, Parkland is, is trying to, to really kind of focus on, you know, how do we start to reimagine the healthcare delivery system in a different way, do so in a way that is data informed, that certainly identifies the needs of our patients, um, brings care to them rooted in the community, um, but ultimately then recognizes that we are stronger together 
And so partnering with other uh, community-based organizations can allow us to develop solutions that we believe are, are born out of the needs and desires of the community as opposed to us parachuting in uh, and dictating what we believe needs to be done. Michael, I think that if people are listening to this, they probably would have a strong sense of surprise at how broad you are talking about your work. Because I think most people who hear that we're going to talk to the president and CEO of a hospital foundation assume that we're, we're going to be talking about the need for philanthropy, uh, that, that you're out there raising money and your whole job is to raise money for another machine in the hospital or for, uh, you know, some expanded wing that will be named after some rich person, right? And here you are doing a, a real community-based analysis, a social analysis of, of what's needed and, uh, and you know, not, not just making a pitch for money, although the, the money follows the mission, right? So, yeah, of course. Uh, so we, we understand that part of it. But I, I think what we're, what we're aiming in this whole series on poverty is to help people realize that there's not one solution to poverty. It is, as you say, this enormous constellation of, of things. So we're, we're talking about education and the, the, the zip code you live in and the uh, amount of family income that you have and the uh, access to good healthy foods and uh, the, the kind of housing that you have and transportation. All of these things come together and they're sort of taken for granted by people who live, say, where I do, right? So uh, th there's, I think you and I talked about this at one point. I'm trying to remember the numbers. Maybe you can help me. But uh, the life expectancy of people who live uh, from one part of Dallas to the next decreases like by two years per every mile or something. What is that number? Yes, yeah. So it's about 1.5 years. And essentially, uh, if we would just uh, simply just you know, focus on south versus north, there's about a 23-year uh, average uh, variance in life expectancy. And, and this is 2020, right? And so yeah. it's, it's un unfathomable, unfathomable right. to think right. that we're facing this. Yeah, and, and we, don't, we don't realize that. I mean, it, it, of course, like 84% of the tax base uh, in Dallas is north of the Trinity River. So we, we do have an enormous uh, sense of inequity in, 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 uh, in Dallas. But you and I have talked offline about this. And last week we presented the, uh, the really great news that our parent organization of Good God, Faith Commons, has been able to contribute to the alleviation of poverty and, and whatnot uh, because of medical debt. And uh, I, I want to reiterate that and, and have you comment on it a bit. But uh, we, uh, we were, because of a grant to us, able to work with a group called RIP Medical Debt. And we were able to expunge and completely eliminate more than $4 million worth of personal medical debt that people were carrying in Dallas County alone, largely in disadvantaged communities. Uh, that has, I'm sure, a, a, a jubilee effect in people's lives, don't you think? It really does. You know, medical debt, um, like, like a lot of debt, um, certainly it, it shackles uh, individuals and families. Um, it, it really impedes their ability um, to, to seek the, the kind of holistic care and, and wellness that they're looking for. Um, and it really becomes almost a form of trauma, I would yes. say, um, as you are, are facing, um, uh, you know, the, the spiraling effects of, of, of debt, uh, eviction, um, et cetera. And so um, I think initiatives such as what you've described are, are needed. Um, you know, we need to, to continue to find ways where we can remove the burden. And so certainly RIP medical debt um, is, uh, is a, an activity and, and really a, an initiative that uh, is, is needed, frankly, uh, particularly again, going back to um, looking at Dallas County, looking at um, where our vulnerable populations are, the challenges that they are faced with and opportunities we have to consistently remove 
um, as many barriers and burdens um, as, as possible. And I think certainly uh, from a financial standpoint, to the extent that we can offer a form of emancipation uh, by removing the, the debt, that definitely puts us on a stronger pathway by which um, individuals ultimately can, can be better positioned uh, to, to engage uh, in the fullest sense uh, in society as, as they desired. Well, right. And they'll be able to get loans now uh, because th they've got that off their books. They'll be able to walk around without the heavy weight that they're carrying, looking over their shoulder, wondering whether, when the, the, the next uh, collector is going to call and that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, from a faith standpoint, uh, both in uh, the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures, there is this language about the good news to the poor. Uh, that uh, that God is bringing good news to the poor, and uh, that part of that is the uh, year of jubilee and the cancellation of debts and the sabbatical year and all those sorts of things that are part of a very inconvenient uh, mm. message to the economic systems we live in, and right. yet our liberation and emancipation for many people. And so how do we make that a connection right in our own times? And that's what we're trying to do. Michael, I, w I wonder if as we get ready to close here, if, if you could say a word about um, how you view this as a spiritual calling of your own. We, we call this program Good God, and uh, the God part uh, and the good part go together. So uh, I, I wonder if you could speak to that personally. They really do. You know, uh, if I think about my, my upbringing um, and certainly the, the lessons that I learned as a child and, and what has sustained me uh, in my faith, in particular, there, there are two scriptures that, that certainly come to mind. Um, the first is um, Isaiah 61, 1, um, and really recalling the prophet Isaiah um, speaking about binding up the brokenhearted, mm -hmm. uh, proclaiming uh, freedom to the, for the captives. Um, um, and the second is, you know, Matthew uh, 25, 35. Uh, you know, if I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you welcomed me. You know, I think at the, at the heart of, of both of those scriptures is this idea of, of, of connectedness, um, really the act of gaining increased proximity um, to, to those around us um, with, a, with a, a goal of, of realizing the kind of the wholeness um, that must exist um, that we, I believe, are, are called to, to perfect. I think if we can shorten the distance between ourselves and others, we often uh, also, I think, um, start to breed more compassion and empathy. Um, and when I think about that, you know, empathy in particular um, in the work that I'm called to do now, my life's work um, really is, it's not a passive operation, you know, but it's one of agency, right? So like we're, we're having to actively choose that we're going to dismantle the walls of division. We're going to dismantle the barriers, debt, um, access to care, um, educational opportunities, uh, transportation, food, uh, access to healthy foods, right? So we're going to take all those, those walls that are erected um, and replace them with, with, with bridges of, of love, of understanding. And I would say this, this corporate responsibility that we have to our brothers and sisters. Um, you know, I, I definitely believe in that, that notion of an unconditional love that agape love, um, that's unwavering, that's relentless, um, that is preoccupied with this belief that, you know, my success is only tied to the success of others. Therefore, I'm going to actively work every single day to ensure that collectively we all can realize uh, the, the promise and potential that we have. And so, um, you know, whether it's, you know, raising philanthropic support, increasing uh, awareness of the work that Parkland is, is doing and why we need to make these investments. For me, it is certainly um, tied to those, those core beliefs of service, those core beliefs of, 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 of making sure that we are actively uh, reaching out um, to, to those around us and doing so uh, with, a, with a spirit of compassion, love, um, and empathy. Well, Michael, you, you are a wonderful spokesperson for this work, and we are so glad that we get to do it with you in Dallas County. Thank you for your labors on behalf of uh, Parkland and, and, and Dallas County generally, and uh, your spiritual uh, motivation that inspires us too. Uh, we look forward to lots more times uh, working together in the future, and God bless you from good God. Thank you. Glad to have you. 
Thank you for tuning in to Good God. We're grateful that we get to be able to offer these conversations to you free of charge, and especially now during this time of COVID-19 that is disturbing the peace for all of us. We know that there are a lot of people and organizations that need your funding. And so we're grateful to have the funding necessary to be able to present this to you without asking you to support us at this time. Please give generously to your faith communities and also to those nonprofits that are serving to encourage us during these days.